Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Come on, let's stand and let's worship him this morning. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, yes, you've already won. Come on, sing it out, y'all. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with God. Come on, can we sing this out? Come on. Show me one thing he can do. Show me a mountain he can do. He's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. Oh, I believe that this morning. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me. There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light, and in his kingdom, every dead thing is bound to rise. Oh, God, our Redeemer, he is faithful to revive. Oh, yes, he will revive.
when I cannot see you move. I believe that you will always come through. Yeah. So this is how we live. So I will live by faith and not by sight. Knowing that you're walking by my side. Waiting for what only you can do. I believe that you will bring a breakthrough. Come on, let's stand on this word. Oh, Christ is on me, rock, I stand on the ground, you see. Y'all know that one? 
Come on, can we sing it again? Come on, one, two, come on. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all love and ground in sinking sand, all love and ground in sinking sand. Come on, just the voices. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all love. Oh, yeah. 
Come on, don't let it end right here. Just all over this room watching online. Just tell him in your own voice. Come on, you've read the words on the screen for a few minutes. Tell him in your own heart how much he means to you. Come on, just declare his magnificence. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you today. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He never changes. Lord, one of the great things about you is that you never change. We can always depend on you. We can depend on you five years ago the same way we can depend on you right now with new things that we're walking through, new troubles, new hardships, new thoughts. Lord, you're the same God. You haven't changed. The same God you were for the people that we read about in your word. You're the same God today that looks at us and holds us up in our time of need the one that we can go to to find grace and mercy in our time of need. Lord, your holiness and your, the splendor of it, we, we could never take in fully as human beings. We, we quite literally explode. We just, we were not made to, in our sinful selves, we're, we're, we're not able to take you fully in. There's coming a day though when we will. All we can do now is worship you in faith, sing a song like that, and not just on a screen, but Lord, in our hearts, sing to you and in faith know and with your Holy Spirit confirming that there is a God that loves us, who is holy and mighty and, and he never changes and he's powerful enough to walk through, not just with us in life, but to, to experience success. It may not always look like what we think, but you're gonna get us through. You know, I was sitting here singing this song and anytime it's in a moment like this I never take me coming up lightly I'm, I'm going God what do you want to say what do you want to speak and I, I just in my heart I think what he wants to tell us today is that one of his favorite songs is when you sing that uh, it, the Bible says there's angels continually around his throne holy 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 is the Lord God almighty but yet when he looks at his creation that sings it in faith the angels see him. You don't see him with your eyes. You have to sing a song like that in faith. And oh, does it capture the heart of our father. And you know what? You weren't worthy to sing that in his presence, but there's a man named Jesus, the very son of God that came to this earth to die for you. And so now when we come into the presence of God, believing in what Jesus did for us, we're worthy. We're accepted. And I just want to tell you that there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. There is no guilt. And so I don't know how many of you are feeling like you're not worthy to sing a song like that in the presence of an almighty God. Well, the answer is simple. You're not, but Jesus makes you worthy. And that's what makes it so beautiful coming into his presence. That's his, his favorite song is when you sing it. The other thing I want to tell you, the second thing, is that the victory that you need in your life could just be on the other side of a worship like that. You know, oftentimes in the scriptures we read where Israel would go out to battle and the worshipers would be on the front lines. It's a bad day to be on the praise and worship team, Pastor Terrell. But they would. They, they would send out the worshipers first. And in that worship, God would begin to move and do things. And that's a precedent that we need to establish in our own lives as we think about the battles that we're facing. It hasn't, hasn't not got God's attention. He's still looking at you. And Israel didn't go look at what they could do first. They just looked to their God and began to worship him. And oftentimes we see where barriers were broken and battle lines were completely demolished just on the worship of the people of Israel. How much more could, could we worship and God begin to change things in our lives that we never knew could change? Things that you've given up on. The best miracles I believe in your life is just on the other side of surrender and worship to God. I'm not one of these pastors that's just gonna say, oh, a blessing's coming, a blessing's coming. I'm not that guy because the Bible doesn't say that. The, the Bible says that God's favor is on us when we surrender to him. 
That's the best form of worship you can have. But then guess what? Intimacy begins to happen with God and God begins to move. It's not that he can't, he's able. But when we position ourselves into an attitude of worship and surrender, singing a song just like that, God begins to move. Just think about that for a second. The thing you walked in here with, the breakthrough for that could just be on the other side of worship to him. And I just want to, I want to stop with that because I know we got to go forward and I'm not going to preach a sermon before the sermon. Turn to your neighbor and say, thank you, Jesus. But I just wanted to pause here for a moment and say worship just like that could just be the thing between you and what you're asking God to do. Can we just say a prayer before we move any further? Father, we know that you are holy and you're mighty, God, and we know through your word that that holiness and that might, it, it can come into our lives and not just save our souls, which man, that's the greatest thing ever. But Lord, make our lives here so full of who you are that other people begin to notice and say, man, where I, I gotta have whatever you've got. Lord, you, you haven't called us to live broke and behind and in relational turmoil. Yeah, we walk through those things because we're humans on earth, but it's not supposed to overtake us. We're supposed to walk through seasons of that. David said, I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death, not put up a tent and camp there. Our lives are supposed to be defined by who you are. And so God, I, I just pray that, that this connect today, that we begin to worship in a way that's different. In Jesus' name, thank you so much, Father. Can we say amen together? Amen. Turn to two people, tell them you're glad to be here with them today. You can have a seat where you are. Uh, there's a few things happening around the Bridge Church I want to make you aware of. If you didn't know, I'm, I'm Pastor Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at the Bridge Goldsboro. Thank you for being here today. If you're here for the very first time today, thank you so much for being here. There is a connect card on the seat back in front of you. Uh, it's for everybody in the room. It's for you online. There's a digital connect card there. Uh, but we especially like it if you're here for the very first time to fill it out so we can know that you're here. There's a place that says I'm here for the first time. Check that box and take that connect card if you're here on site to our desk out in the lobby here. It's our VIP desk. We have uh, a gift we wanna put in your hands, just our way of saying thank you for being here. But we also wanna meet you. We wanna take a, a second or two with some of our staff and just put a face with a name. We promise we won't hold you too long. Uh, but that connect card is for everybody because it also has uh, check boxes that you can check to have a next step. Or maybe you want prayer and you want to know how, how, can, how can I get my prayer request to the staff here? Well, that's the way you do it through the connect card. I like to say it like this. It's not a means to get information from you, but it's to be a resource to you. Uh, I'll also throw this out there for free. If you haven't filled one out in a long time, sometimes our back end system technology Everybody say technology. Don't, don't we love it? Sometimes it, it says, oh, this person hadn't been here in a long time and it, it throws you to an inactive status. Um, so I promise that's not a manipulation tool. Uh, it's just the way we keep our, our, uh, our, our back end clean. Um, and so make sure you fill it out. If you haven't filled one out in a while, make sure you just fill it out. Make sure that we know that you're here uh, so that we can make sure our system stays clean. A couple of things I wanna make mention of. On October 6th, uh, we're having a friend day. And that means you're going to invite a friend to church. And here's why, because we're gonna be having an outdoor service. Uh, and that outdoor service is gonna be different than we do when we're in here. It's still gonna have a sermon. We're still gonna do praise and worship, uh, but we're gonna be doing a lot more stuff. It's also gonna be a potluck lunch. Turn to somebody and say, I gotta bring food to church. So if you don't do that, then we're all gonna be trying to dig out of three KFC boxes and I promise you that won't go well. Uh, so here's the rule for potluck. Bring enough for you and your family and a smidge more for somebody else and we're all gonna share together. We've been doing this for a couple years in a row now and it's, it actually turns out really good. So good job. So plan on bringing something on October 6th and also bring a friend. We're gonna have some invitations next week for you guys to be able to pass out uh, to your friends and, your, and to your family who get not go to another church. Please don't do that. We're not, we don't want people to church hop, but people that do not have a home church or maybe somebody that doesn't have a relationship with Christ and we want you to begin praying. God, who do you want me to give this invitation to? Some of you already know. And the idea is that we are going to get them here and we're gonna preach the gospel message and they're gonna hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news.
good news. And we're going to have a blast doing it. We're going to have inflatables. Uh, we're going to have some other fun games for kids and adults. So make sure that you're here on October 6th. That's going to start at 10 a.m. Um, also, we have bridge groups that are starting in October. This is our promotion month. And we're talking about bridge groups and how much life is in bridge groups. Did you know that Jesus ministered to thousands, but he only discipled 12? He had a, a small group of people around him and he modeled for us how to do life together. Ministry is one thing. You can minister to a lot of people. You can be acquaintances with a lot of people. But when it, when it comes time to who am I going to do life with? Who am I going to be praying for continually? Who needs to pray for me? That happens through bridge groups. Not to mention you deeper your faith and your walk in Jesus Christ through some of the things that you'll be learning. So if you haven't already, sign up for a bridge group. Uh, Connect Night is on September 25th. So that's the end of this month. And that's meant to do just that, to connect. And that's happening right here at the Bridge Goldsboro. We're actually going to have it in this room. Uh, and that's going to be a potluck finger food. Somebody say finger food. A lot of things going on. And we're, we're gonna talk about how to connect to the church. There's gonna be lots of opportunities, but also uh, if you're already doing some things in the church, it's also an opportunity to come and hang out with some, some of your church family. So want, put that in your calendar, make sure you're a part of that and good night. Just kidding. <laughs> we did that on purpose. We just like to keep things a little lively around here. Um, but make sure that, that you are a part of that. And, and I'll, I'll say this too, you're gonna to be hearing more about this. Uh, we're going to be starting a six month serving season starting in November. And you might say, what in the world is that? That means if, if, if you're not serving in the church somewhere, uh, we want you to begin serving in the church. And here's how we're gonna do it. You're gonna hear more information about this. I'm just gonna give you a 90,000 foot view. You're gonna sign up to serve six months and that's it. And at the end of that six months, you're gonna have the opportunity to take a break. You're gonna have the opportunity to re-up and do it again or look at what another ministry is and maybe serve there. Uh, we believe in the word of God when it says there's a time to work and there's a time to rest. And we just wanna make sure we take care of our volunteers. How many of you have ever served in a church where when you sign up to serve, the unwritten sort of policy is you're there until Jesus comes back, right? And then uh, some of our volunteers now are raising their hands, yeah. And that's really not the case. That's not how Jesus described it. There, there's a time to rest in your life. And so we wanna make sure that serving at church is something that not only you enjoy doing, but that's fulfilling to you and that you can be overflowing to other people. And so this is a, kind of a new approach that we're taking. And so if you're not serving anywhere, um, I want you to take a second, look at that connect card. And I want, you to, I want you to check, I'm interested in next steps or I'm interested in serving. And we wanna help you get to what we're calling new season orientation, which is on November 3rd. And we're gonna talk about all this in a lot more detail. You're going to be hearing more about it. But this church has so many opportunities for you to serve. And, and I, I always use the word opportunity on purpose rather than need, because it's really your opportunity. The f serving is one of the most fulfilling things you'll ever do. And not because Pastor Ryan said it, but it's because it's the way God made you. You're designed and wired to serve other people in your life. And so we wanna give you the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, there's so many opportunities. Uh, so you can go on our website and, and fill that out and uh, you can uh, use a connect card to let us know you're interested in serving. Take a second, look at that connect card. Um, make sure that you don't leave without filling it out. Uh, if you're online again, you can get to a digital connect card. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? How many of you woke up today just excited in anticipation about what God's going to speak to you? Come on, are you ready to receive it? Watch the screens.
you a question. Have you, have you ever been so angry? <laughs> I didn't even finish the sentence and somebody's like, yes, I have. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> Sorry, that was funny. Have you ever been so angry that you said or did something that you didn't mean to do? And after you did it, like you had to deal with the fallout of it and you knew that I, sh I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. But yet the anger that you allowed to lead the way caused you to do something that you didn't want to say and that you didn't mean to say. And now I'm dealing with a fallout that if I could have had a time machine and I could go back, I would never wish upon myself. Uh, we say things in anger that we don't mean to say. Uh, it reminds me of a story of a mom who had her young boy at the beach and she didn't want to get her feet wet. So she stayed sort of on the shore and her son went out a little too far and waves are crashing. And this one particularly really big wave crashes over him and, and he gets washed out to sea. A current takes him away. The wave recedes and he's gone. And, and she gets so angry and she gets angry at God and she lifts up her finger to God and says, why did you do this to me? And then she does the thing that we do sometimes. I, I go to church every single Sunday and I give and I'm generous and I, I serve and I, I read my Bible every day and list all the things that she does. God, why could you do this to me? And the story goes that a voice booms down from heaven and says, okay, okay. And then another big wave comes and crashes and the water recedes and there's her son smiling, looking at mom. And she looks up and says, he had a hat. So sometimes we let anger get to us to the point that we say a whole lot worse than that, don't we? We do things that we don't mean. Uh, we're in a series called Target on Your Back, and we're talking about how to handle life when somebody has it out for you, when someone has a target on your back. And we're also talking about how sometimes we put targets on other people's backs and, and how that traps us into doing what we know we shouldn't. And we're looking at the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, uh, and we're looking at the life of King Saul. He was the first king of Israel, and his servant David, who actually became king later, he was the second king. But these two had a very interesting interaction. Uh, David served Saul. In fact, he was anointed to be king, but his first assignment was to serve the present king. How many of you know that God has a very specific thing for your life, but sometimes it means being in a position of servanthood before you have something else? And the worst thing we could ever do is, is rush that season and try to get in front of God because we know that God said something's coming. But there's something called time before that happens. And that's typically the season that God wants to journey with you and shape you into who you need to be in order to handle the blessing well. We, we better not rush that. David did a great job at not rushing that season. Was he perfect? No. But in this season, he is serving the, the king, King Saul. And Saul sends him out on missions with the army. And David is spectacular with a perfect record in every mission that he goes on. The troops love David. He has the approval of the officers. In fact, the king's son, Jonathan, loves David. In fact, they're like brothers more than friends. They're kindred spirits. They love one another. And when they come back to town after these missions being so successful, Buzz has already gotten to the town and they're singing praises uh, and they're really singing praises to David. Oh, look at David. Look at all these things that he's done. And the king is getting praises shouted to him too, but not as much as David is. And they sing this song, David has killed his tens of thousands and Saul only his thousands. And Saul feels, say feels, feels. he feels like David might be trying to do something because he's getting more pomp than he is. Sometimes the battle that we're facing is feel and not real. And so Saul paints a target on David's back. And this is what I know, when something like feels and something like emotions begins to stir in you and you don't settle it, anger tends to be the result. Let me say that again. When emotions begin to stir in you and you don't settle it, anger tends to be the result. We're gonna pick up the story in chapter 18, verse 28, it says this, when the king realized how much the Lord was with David and how immensely popular he was with all the people, he became even more... What's the word? Afraid. Afraid. And he grew to hate him with every passing day. Notice how it didn't start with David doing something against him. It didn't start with him going behind his back and trying to usurp his authority. It started because Saul was afraid. 
fear. And this is the first thing I want you to understand. Unchecked fear leads to a growing anger. You may have never associated those two things, but an unchecked fear will lead to a growing anger. It'll lead to a growing anger against the person or the thing that you think is causing the fear. And the reason why the fear is still there is because you haven't settled it. You haven't checked it. And so if you don't check it with the Lord and get truth, then it's gonna fester inside of you. And the more it festers, the more your brain and your body begins to say, I can't have this fear. So you begin to turn against whatever it is you think you feel is causing the fear. Saul ended up not dealing with his fear. He didn't give it to God. He didn't think about the words of Samuel years prior when he said, hey, you didn't make yourself king. God made you king. God established you. His word went out and established you as king. He could have gone back and said, yes, God, you did say that. My fear is not rational right now. I'm, I'm not dealing in, in rationality. I'm dealing with an emotion. So he didn't settle that with God. Therefore, it led to anger and hate. Saul ended up not doing that. So there was a particular time he tried to actually take David's life, throwing a spear at him. And David was fast. And so he escaped. And Saul decided that what he would do is he would get his men to assassinate David in his sleep. And so David, and again, the king's son, Jonathan, they were friends. And so they go to each other and they begin uh, to speak. But before that, Jonathan goes to his dad to talk about this whole thing that he's wanting to do against David. This is what he says in chapter 19, verse four. He, David, he's never done anything to harm you, Jonathan pleaded. He's always helped you in every way that he could. Have you forgotten about the time that he risked his life to kill Goliath? and about how the Lord brought a great victory to Israel as a result. You were certainly happy about it then. Why should you murder an innocent man? Listen, there is no reason for it at all. So somebody very rational is talking to an irrational person, trying to, trying to plead with them. Have you ever tried to do that to somebody who is so angry they just can't see truth? Maybe that's been you and someone's been saying, listen, you're, you're angry, I get it. They're feeling, you're feeling lots of big things right now, but let's take a, an inventory of what's really happening around you. Does what you're feeling, is it tied to an actual thing, to a real, or is it, is it just a feel? There's no reason for it all, he said. Here's the second thing you need to know. Unchecked anger leads to irrational actions. David's done absolutely nothing to Saul. In fact, if he's done anything, he's helped him. Yet his anger led him to be irrational. I heard a story about a husband and a wife. They were having lots of conversations about money and they were talking about a specific expenditure, one that actually was good for the family, uh, but they differed on their opinion about whether they should do it. And the, the, one of the spouses said, we, we really need to do this, while the other spouse said, we really don't need to do this. And it was emotional. It wasn't a rational thing. And the spouse ended up just doing it without telling the other one. Well, when that spouse found out, they got so angry, in the name of Jesus, help us. Probably like that, like they were really upset. <laughs> and the spouse found out about it and they got so upset, they went and took every single cent that they had in accounts, closed those accounts and opened up a new one with the other spouse's name not on it. So angry, devastated his, his wife. Later wrote a book called How to Ruin Your Marriage in One Step. Just kidding, really didn't do that, but... Here's what I want you to know. Unchecked anger will lead to some irrational actions. And we can say we're sorry, we can ask for forgiveness, but we can't take it back. And so Jonathan's talking to his dad and he's saying, listen, David's done nothing to harm you. He's done nothing but help you. Why would you try to kill this innocent man? Why would you keep this target on his back? And look at what verse six says. It says, finally, Saul agreed and vowed, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. I love the word finally there. There was some time in this conversation. And finally, he got to a place of level-headedness and he said, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna do what I said. Did you know that even in your anger, even when the emotions are strong, that God will typically give you a moment of clarity? I say typically, when we're seeking him as Christians, that doesn't mean that we'll never get angry and mad. But when we're seeking him with our lives and we're, the heart of our life is, Lord, I, I wanna do your will. When we're at the, the height of our anger and getting ready to do something, the Holy Spirit will check you and give you a moment of clarity. You won't feel like doing it. You'll fight everything inside of you to, to 
to push that thing away and go for what you really want to do. But the Holy Spirit, God will give you a moment of clarity. And the question is, is what are you going to do with it? Are you going to let emotions lead you or are you going to surrender yourself to the Lord? So the Bible says that Saul told his son, okay, I, I won't kill him. You're right. So Jonathan goes to David and said, hey, dad's not going to kill you after all. <laughs> Isn't that great? Perfect. All right. And David's happy about this. Some time goes by. Some life rhythms kind of get back to what they used to be. Uh, remember, I talked about last week that David was not only a great warrior, he was a great musician. And so Saul would have him come into his, into his room and, and play for him sometimes when he was upset about different things. Verse uh, nine says, one day Saul was sitting at his home listening to David playing the harp. Time has gone on. David's back in relationship with Saul. Suddenly the tormenting spirit from the Lord attacked him and he had a spear in his hand and he hurled it at David in an attempt to kill him. So this is the second time he's thrown a spear at him. But David dodged out of the way and fled into the night, leaving the spear embedded in the timber of the wall. And David's probably thinking, I don't know who he was throwing that at, but I thought all this killing me nonsense was over. It's a weird way to kill a fly. Maybe he was aiming it at me. And, and the Bible says he fled into the night. Saul had a moment of clarity, but he never dealt with the actual emotion. Do you know that sometimes you can have that moment of clarity that we talked about and you say, okay, I'm not gonna do that and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on. But do you know that if you don't deal with the emotion of it, that's all it'll be is a moment of clarity? If you don't go through the time that it takes to heal and, and walk through the pain of surrendering that thing to the Lord and dealing with the emotions in your heart, that's all it'll ever be is a moment of clarity. And when the emotion hits again, you'll be right back doing the same thing. Folks, sometimes years will go by and all of a sudden you're just as angry as you were as if it had just happened yesterday. Why? Because you haven't dealt with the emotions of it. You haven't walked through the pain of healing but instead you just had a moment of what you think you know in your head, but you've never dealt with the emotions in your heart. Look at what David does in verse 18. It says, David got away and went to Ramah to see Samuel and told him all that Saul had done to him. Now remember, Samuel was the one, he was the prophet of God. He was the one that anointed Saul to be king to, to start with. So Samuel took David with him to live at Naoth. Now there's a couple of things that David did that we need to learn when the target is on our back and things are getting hot and things are getting uh, treacherous. Maybe you're at work and thing, the, the atmosphere is not that great and you know that there's a target on your back. Here's the first thing you need to know. David got out of there. I'm not saying quit, hold on. He, he got out of there. He actually left. Sometimes things are bad enough where you know that if I stay here in this conversation, things are not gonna be productive. Maybe you could be productive, but the other person can't because they're so angry and they've got that target on your back. Sometimes the best thing you can do is walk out of a conversation and say nothing. Somebody say amen. Sometimes when you and your spouse are about to get to the point where it's, it's going to get ugly, one of you or both needs to have the foresight and the clarity and be filled with the Holy Spirit enough to say, hey, babe, we're going to finish this conversation another time. Amen. Not to use that line as a weapon because you're not winning, or because you don't want to deal with things that you need to deal with. But there, there is a genuine love for the other person to go, you know what, we are, well, this is not going to be productive if we keep talking about this. Let's, let's agree to reconcile now our relationship and let's deal with the issue later. Sometimes we think that we have to deal with the issue before we can be reconciled as a, in a relationship, and that's not true. In fact, if you try to reconcile with one another, and the only way that you can do that is by handling the, the issue, the issue may not be handled. In fact, I, I heard it said like this, Pastor Jim Wall used to say, the issue's in the middle, and we're on both sides of it. And you're over there, and I'm over here, and we're both trying to attack the issue, but what happens is we have bad aim, and what happens is we miss the issue and we hit the other person because of our words and because of our actions. And, and the issue is really what's at hand, but things are getting out of play and we're, we're hitting one another and hurting each other. Sometimes we need to get on the same side and, of, of the issue and let the issue be here, not settled yet. And let's figure out together how we're gonna reconcile ourselves. I know that's not fixed, but I want you to know I love you. And we're gonna work this thing out together. Now we're on the same side of the issue. We've reconciled the relationship, but the issue's still not solved. That's fine. Now we're on the same side of it. Now we can attack it together. Does that make sense? 
Reconciliation doesn't mean solving the issue. David had to get out of there. And sometimes that's what you need to do. You need to leave the conversation. Maybe you need to leave the office. Maybe you need to take a day, leave the room. You can still reconcile the issue first. If you've got a target on your back and you know that there's nothing productive is coming out of this, remove yourself. David didn't retaliate. David didn't start a gossip chain. He, he didn't start an injustice gathering to try to figure out who can be on my side about this. He, he just left. He got out of there. He didn't stay gone forever, but he said, I'm, I'm leaving this right now until things cool off. And here's the second thing he did. He sought godly advice. He went to Samuel. He went to the prophet of God. He didn't go to his best friend, Jonathan, even. He didn't go to just to the people that were gonna take his side. He went to an older, wiser person of God, someone that was further along that maybe would tell him something that he didn't wanna know. Can I tell you one of the most important things you could ever do when someone's got a target on your back is seek godly counsel from people who are living a godly life. Not somebody who goes to church during the week but lives like a hellion some, some, uh, on, during the week but goes on Sunday. Not, not somebody who has these opinions or who's, a, who's you know, a mile wide and an inch deep. You know who I'm talking about. It's one thing to be a, have an association with God. It's a whole other thing to have a relationship with God. And when we are in a place where the decisions we're making now are literally going to affect the, the rest of our lives sometimes, we need to get into a place and get into the atmosphere of people that are living out a relationship with God and whose life is demonstrating the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So he goes to, to Samuel. Look what happens next. Verse 19, it says, when, when the report reached Saul that David was at Naoth uh, and Ramah, he sent soldiers to capture him. I love this. But when they arrived and saw Samuel and the other prophets prophesying, prophesying just means that they were speaking under the inspiration of God. It says that the spirit of God came on them and they also began to prophesy. So when Saul heard that that happened to them, he sent more soldiers, but they too began to prophesy. So there's this thing happening where they're, they're going to capture him, but they're getting into the presence of Samuel and David and these other prophets, and they're, they're, they're hearing God speak to them. That happened a third time. Finally, Saul's like, I'm going to go. He demanded, where's, where's Samuel? Where's David? Look at verse 23. But on the way, the spirit of God came upon Saul and he too began to prophesy. Isn't that how we should be? We should be so full of the spirit of God that, that nothing can influence, influence us negatively, but we have the spirit of God and it overflows in such a way that our lives begin to influence them. Come on, somebody. Somebody may have a target on your back. They may be, they may be full of negativity, but you're so full of the truth of God that you don't respond like they think you're going to respond. You, you don't respond like other people think that you're going to respond. You don't allow negative thoughts to just concentrate in your mind, but you give those to the Lord and instead, get this, you begin to pray for them. You begin to ask God to bless them. Which by the way, if you have a problem with that, just know the first thing God's going to bless them with is a knowledge that they need him. So you should have no problem asking God to bless your enemies. Bless them, Lord. God knows the priority of what they need. And God on the inside of you, think about it, so concentrated that instead of them affecting your atmosphere, you begin to affect theirs. Saul and his men, they, they got into the very proximity of David and Samuel and they became aware that God is speaking to me. So the Bible says that Saul began to weep and cry. And you would think that after that, he would learn his lesson. But it's amazing that one moment of tears doesn't change a heart. And the Bible says that he makes plans to kill David as a, at a festival that's coming up. It was called the New Moon Festival. It was a, a, a Jewish festival that they celebrated at the very beginning of every month to bring in a new month. They have more festivals and celebrations than I think any group of people on the planet. Uh, and I think they, they still do that. Uh, Jews do. It looks a little bit different nowadays. But there's this festival coming up and Saul knows everybody's gonna be there. And so he says, well, I'll kill David there. And so David goes to Jonathan to tell him about everything that's happened. He told him about fleeing to, to Samuel, told him about all the people that came and began to prophesy. And he says he's, he hasn't backed off. And Jonathan, all he knows is that last conversation he had with his dad, that moment of level-headedness. And Jonathan says, no, I, I talked to dad. He's, he's not gonna kill you. He said, that's, that's done with. And David says, no, he's still trying to kill me. His, this is still happening. And the two kind of go back and forth. And, and now David is perplexed because Jonathan's so sure 
that his dad's not going to kill him. And Jonathan's perplexed because David's just told him about this story and they don't know what to do. When a target is on your back, sometimes you get in a position where you've done everything you can do to talk. You've done everything you can do that seems sensible and rational. But yet when you lay your head down at night, you still feel this heaviness that there's something going on between me and this other person. What do I do? What, what do I do? At that point, sometimes the, the temptation is to say, well, I've done everything I was supposed to do and that didn't work. So now I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And that's where we get in trouble. That's when we need to do something else. And so this is what David and Jonathan decide to do. They make a plan. And they say, Jonathan, you're going to go to the festival and I'm going to go hide in a field. <laughs> I'm not going to go because I don't know exactly what's, what's going to happen. And I want you to go there and I want you to, to find out from your dad. He's going to notice that I'm not there and he's going to ask where I am and when you, when you tell him where I am, tell him that I needed to go back to Bethlehem, which is where he's from, to a family reunion. And I asked you, could I be excused? And that you told me yes. And how he responds is gonna tell us whether he's actually trying to kill me or not, or if he has backed off of that and heard from the Lord, cooled his jets, and this target on my back is gone. And Jonathan said, okay, and this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna do that. And then I'm gonna come back to this field that you're hiding in and I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot some arrows pretending to do target practice. I'm gonna have a little boy with me and I'm gonna shoot the arrows and they're gonna land in a certain spot. And if you hear me tell the boy that goes to retrieve the arrows that, hey, that's where the arrows are, grab them and come back, then that means my dad is, is good. He's not trying to kill you. But if I tell the boy, go on further, the arrows are beyond you. He said, that's how you're gonna know that all bets are off that the target is there and my dad's trying to murder you. This whole plan, the, whole, the fact that David's still there after two attempts on his life is amazing to me. It tells us that even when we think that we've done everything we can do, we still need to stay and find out what God can do. Here's how I wanna put it to you. Investigate, don't instigate. Don't instigate your own plan. Don't instigate a fight. Don't think you've done everything you're supposed to do and God must be done, so now it's my turn to, to instigate something. Investigate. David didn't instigate something with Saul. He didn't even go behind his back and start talking. He investigated to figure out what was real and what was not. See, instigating causes harm, but investigating establishes the truth. Can I ask you a question? What situations have you instigated when what you should have been doing is asking questions? What situations have you gone in your own mind and in your own power and assumed somebody else's motives when what you should have done is start with a question? Maybe you should start a conversation like this. Help me understand rather than you always do. I'm, I'm having trouble processing what it is that we're walking through because this is how I feel whenever you do this. Help me understand where you're coming from and then open your ears, shut your mouth and let somebody else speak. Asking questions is sometimes the most neutral thing that you can do to help the conversation go forward. Investigate, don't instigate. So that's what they do. Jonathan goes to the celebration. He's trying to find out what's going on with dad. Saul notices that David's not there. So he says, where's, uh, he actually doesn't say anything the first day. The second day, he says, hey, notice David's not here again. Where's David? And Jonathan tells him, well, he wanted to go to a family reunion in Bethlehem. So I told him that he could go. Look at what he does in verse 30. It says that Saul boiled with rage. You see how this growing anger is happening in him? And he looks at his son and says, you fool. Do you think I don't know that you want this son of a nobody to be king in your place? We think, man, I was close, Saul. Do you know the word, the modern way to say that is a SOB? That's what Saul was saying to his son in that moment. And that's, that's what anger will do. He says, I, I don't know. What's going on? He said, do you think I don't know that? Shaming yourself and your mother, as long as that fellow was alive, you'll never be king. Now go and get him so I can kill him. And now they knew what Saul's real motive was. They investigated. You know, sometimes it doesn't work out. 
Sometimes you investigate and you find out there's an exodus getting ready to happen. But listen, not without trying. When God says it's time to go, I promise it'll be time to go. But don't get out in front of him. And typically the time to go isn't the time you think it's time to go. God's willing to let you walk through more pain than you're willing to walk through. Why? Because he wants to show you how to hold his hand as you walk through pain. We want to escape pain. Lord, show me a bypass. I already know what's going to happen when I get in that situation because I've already sort of sat here for a minute and God's saying, yeah, hold my hand and walk a little further. So I just want to encourage you, if, if you feel like you've come to the end of your rope, that's the exact moment that God's saying, now you can finally see me. I want you to hold my hand and I promise you, I'm going to walk you through this. David stayed Jonathan retorted back at him in verse 32. Well, what has he done? Jonathan demanded. Why should he be put to death? Then Saul did something really crazy. He took his spear and he hurled it at Jonathan, intending to kill him. So at last, Jonathan realized that his father really meant it when he said David must die. Jonathan left the table, listen, in fierce anger. We're gonna talk about the difference in a second. He refused to eat all day for he was crushed by his father's shameful behavior toward David. See, we, we see anger destroying not only a relationship between Saul and David, but now anger is destroying a relationship between father and son. It doesn't stop just with one relationship. It has tentacles that goes out and it has, has uh, damaging properties that you're not even seeing when you let anger lead. Unchecked fear leads to a growing anger and a growing anger leads to irrational actions and irrational actions can devastate relationships. Do you think it's any wonder that God tells us in James chapter one, verse 19, when he says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, quick to investigate, quick to ask questions and slow to become angry because human anger, say human anger. That doesn't produce the kind of righteousness that God desires. The Greek word there actually indicates that God can't complete his full plan in your life while human anger is taking the lead in your life. You say, well, you just said human anger. Is there another kind of anger? Yeah, it's called righteous anger. And it's the same anger that, that Jesus had whenever he was in the temple and the poor were being exploited. It, it was this righteous anger. It's the anger that Jonathan had, not at his father. It was, it was this anger that there was an injustice being done to David whenever David had done nothing wrong. Human anger is concerned about me and what I think. Righteous anger is concerned about God and what he thinks is right. There's nothing wrong with anger in and of itself. In fact, if there was, then Jesus would have been guilty of sin. But Jesus got angry, God gets angry, and so do we. It's what we do with that anger that matters. And we gotta ask ourselves, what kind of anger is this? Is this about me and what I think is right? Or is this a righteous anger that's, that's angry that, that somebody's being exploited and they can't help it? That's why God tells us in Ephesians 4, 26, if you're angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. That's a human anger. Don't let the sun go down with you still angry, but get over it quickly. How many times laying in bed with your spouse have you had to say, I'm sorry? How many times have you wanted to say that and didn't? How many times does, if, I'm sorry, the two words in our language that can repair the most devastating blows to reconcile, I'm sorry. And every wife's saying, and the other phrase is, you were right. <laughs> Heard of something recently say that if you know that you're wrong and you apologize, that makes you smart. If you might be wrong, but you apologize anyway, that makes you wise. If you're dead wrong and you apologize, that makes you a husband. You thought I was getting spiritual on you, didn't you? Probably is spiritual. It says when you're angry, you give a devil a mighty foothold. It, when you have this human anger, you give Satan a chance to come in and, and do something in your life when you nurse that grudge. Jesus said it like this for a Christian. 
when another Christian brother or sister, when you have something against them, Jesus said in Matthew 18, if a fellow believer hurts you, the Greek word there means offend you or, or hurt you in some way, makes you mad. Basically, any type of thing you have against them in your heart, no matter how big or small, Jesus says, go to them and tell them, work it out between the two of you, because if they listen, then you've made a friend. In other words, if they listen, if there, there can be some common ground there, then the restoration can happen. Jesus literally gives us a life hack to squashing most of your issues that you're gonna have with somebody. One 10 minute conversation could save you months of pain. Some of you years, one conversation. Here's the danger if you hold on to human anger. Unchecked human anger leads to bitterness. We find that fear leads to a growing anger. A growing anger leads to irrational uh, actions and this human anger that we hold on to leads to bitterness. And King Saul is really a warning to all of us of what bitterness can do to a relationship. Literally a thousand or so years after King Saul, we have this writer of Hebrews in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament telling us in chapter 12, look after each other so that not one of you will fail to find God's best blessings. And here's how, watch out that no bitterness takes root among you. For as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many, say hurting many, in their spiritual lives. There's damage that happens when, when bitterness springs up. Did you know that, that bitterness hurts other people? And I think in our Christian life, aren't we called to do the opposite of that? Especially with one another, aren't we called to be so full of the Holy Spirit and what he wants for our life that even through hurt and pain that we're able to, to give love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and love. This, this is what the, the Holy Spirit produces in us. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says that the Holy Spirit displays God's power through each of us as a means of helping. There's this dichotomy between what bitterness produces and what the Holy Spirit produces. What human anger can lead us to do and destroy without us even knowing. I said in the beginning, we don't wanna do that. It's what ends up happening. We have to bear the consequences along with everybody else in our realm versus what the Holy Spirit wants to do through us in the church. And you may say, well, I'm still there. I'm still here. I'm still attached. I'm, I'm, I haven't gone anywhere. To be sure my anger can't be that bad. It hadn't led me to leave yet. Did, did you know, I was thinking about this the other day, a, a foot with gangrene is still attached to the body. And that body's got to lug it around everywhere it goes. But yet that foot is just doing nothing but causing that body harm. And that's the way God describes us as a church, the body of Christ in every part helping the other. A lady came to a pastor one time and tried to rationalize her angry outbursts. And she said, there's nothing wrong with my temper. I blow up and that's it. And we get on and we move away and it's over. And the pastor looked at her with the wisdom of God and said, yeah, it sounds an awful like what a shotgun does too. It blows up and it's all over. And yet look at the damage that it causes. Ben Franklin said that anger is never without a reason, but seldom a good one. Years ago, I was a, in elementary school and I had this really good friend. I was probably seven or eight years old and we were real close. We played baseball together on the same baseball team. And, and I was from a Christian home and, and he wasn't, uh, but his dad was one of those guys who had just seen that his anger kind of had against people of faith. It's the only way I can sort of describe that. And I'm not sure why, but I was over their house one evening and, uh, you know, me and my buddies in his room, we were playing that afternoon. And, and as, you know, eight-year-olds do, we decide, all right, can I spend the night at your house? All right, you go ask your mom. And, and you know, everything went good. And his mom was like, yeah, you can spend the night. And, uh, and I was like, great. And I was so excited about it. Remember, elementary school, I was gonna get up and eat their cereal in the morning. Anybody ever grow up with your parents gave you generic cereals? Man, I was so excited when I got to spend the night at somebody's house. It was gonna be a name brand with marshmallows in it. <laughs> and I remember his dad got home and I was sitting in the, his room as he went out and told his dad. I remember his dad, this is what he said. What is this reject doing in my house? I'm eight. And I remember thinking, okay. And my buddy said, he might spend the night. And his dad said, and he might not. Just angry. And I'd never been around that kind of thing. Not to that level. And I'm thinking as an adult, who would say that about this eight-year-old kid that's in a room just down the hall? 
and I don't know what happened at work. I, you know, as an adult, I look back at it. I, I don't know if it, was, if it was directed directly at me. I know him and his wife started arguing about a lot of stuff. All I know is, is that when his mama came in and said, hey, honey, do you want to spend the night? I said, I want to go home. <laughs> I, if you paid me to stay here, there ain't enough lucky charms in the world that would make me want to stay here right now. I wanted to go home where I felt secure because this man's anger was out of control and I didn't know what was going to happen. And so I left. And it's interesting that I never wanted to go back to his house. I'd see him at school, see him at the baseball team, but our, our relationship kind of went in two different directions. And I was thinking about that today, that anger destroys more than you think. That destroyed what could have been a great relationship between me and my friend. And I, I got to thinking about Jonathan. He found out his dad uh, was still trying to kill David and he leaves and he goes and he, he's sad and he goes and finds David in this field where David's hiding out. And he does the thing with the arrows and David begins to realize Saul's still trying to take my life and I can't stay here in Jerusalem can't stay. And the Bible says in verse 41 that David came out from where he'd been hiding near the south edge of the field. And both of them, David and Jonathan, were crying as they said goodbye, especially David. So they parted, David going one way and Jonathan returning to the city. See, anger didn't give life. Anger destroyed. Anger didn't help. Anger turned to bitterness and, and severely damaged three different relationships. It damaged severely David and Saul's relationship. It, it damaged a father and son relationship. And then it damaged a, a brotherly relationship, a friendship. That was a godly thing. It, was, it wasn't helpful, it was painful. And can I just tell you that this is not what God wants for your relationships? He wants a healing thing. He wants a, he wants a life-giving thing. He wants your relationships to thrive, but it takes taking human anger and putting it in its proper place before the Lord. If you've got a target on your back, it means staying long enough, doing what's, what's godly to let God tell you when is the time to separate and when is the time to hang in. When is the time to ask questions and when is the time to, to leave? What, what is God telling you to do? But in, in any one of those situations, human anger has no place in the life of a Christian not dwelling in it. Are you gonna get angry sometimes? Absolutely. Are you gonna be tempted to let human anger lead? Sure, Jesus was too. But remember, he turned over tables. He didn't turn over people. And he had this righteous anger specifically because there were the poor being exploited. What, what have you let inside your life as human anger dwell there? And this is how I wanna end today. If you're dealing with anger on the inside of you, I want us to pray a prayer of surrender and lay that thing before the Lord. And, and maybe you're somebody that's, that's on the other end of that anger and you're kind of receiving that you've got the target on your back. I, I want us to pray and ask God that he give you wisdom on what you're supposed to do next. And maybe you're sitting here and you're not in any of those categories. Can I tell you that as long as you're breathing air on earth, you're either coming out of one of those things or getting ready to go into one. Can we just determine today that we're gonna put anger in its proper place? We're gonna let human anger reside at the lap of the Lord and we're gonna let him show us what to do next. Can we just pray together as a church family? Watch it online, don't shut it off yet, let's pray. Our prayer team's coming up. If you want prayer with a person, anytime during this prayer, come up. Father, we know that, that you are our example. We know that anger in a human sense, if we let it fester, it turns into some really bad things. But Father, I, I know that there's a group of people that have questions about that because th some people have this anger inside of them and they don't even know where it came from. They're just angry. Lord, I pray that, that you would give us the gift of self-awareness, Holy Spirit, to tie our actions to what really happened to us maybe so long ago, and that we'd be able to understand why it is that we act the way we do. Give us that gift, Holy Spirit. And maybe it's the journey that's gonna start today where there's gonna be some counseling or there's gonna be some, some uh, calculations, maybe some reflectiveness to think about what it is that's making me do the things I'm doing. For some of us, we know why we're angry. We, we know why we, the rage is in the inside of us. And I just pray right now, God, that you'd show us how to lay it before you and how to walk forward, understanding that we're, we're damaging things more than we, even what we realize. Lord, some of us are, are the, the recipients of that anger and it's hard to live with that. It's hard to live maybe in the same house, maybe at an office, maybe in a relationship. Some of us, 
I know in a room this size and especially online, when you think of that, there's some people that haven't talked to people in years and there's something stuck between them. And I, God, I just pray that, that we would fall on our faces before you and not determine in ourselves to leave that, but to say, Lord, when would you have me to step away? And maybe more importantly, God, how would you have me to step forward? Show us, Father. Show us, Holy Spirit. We, we want to be a people that, as 1 Corinthians said, a body living together that's helping the entire church, that's breathing life into every relationship that we have. Don't let us represent you the wrong way because somebody's wronged us and we're, we're angry. Lord, don't let us represent you the wrong way because there's something on the inside of us in anger and we just can't seem to let it go. Holy Spirit, show us our next step and let us be faithful to listen and faithful to obey. Lord, some of us in the room and watching online, we, we've never put you in charge of our lives. We've never accepted Jesus as the Son of God. Not just that he is the Son of God, but to make him the Lord of our lives. And if that's a question for you today, if you're questioning whether or not you would make it to heaven, if your life somehow just ended right today, if, if where would you spend eternity? And that's a question we all have to ask. And the answer is simply this. We know we were going to heaven if we confess and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he really died and rose again and we live for him on this earth. That's the way. And so if that's you, I wanna give you an opportunity to do that as I pray. Pray it in your own words or, or pray it in mine, but mean it in your heart. Jesus, I need you. I can't be worthy of God the Father on my own. I can't. I'm, I'm an imperfect person. I, I don't care how good I've tried to be. I'm not perfect. And that's what the Father demands because he's perfect. We can't live an imperfect life and go before a per perfect heaven and expect that to match. It just won't. But Jesus, you sent him to here to this earth to, to die a perfect death, live a perfect life. He never sinned. And your word says when we believe in him and take him on, you see his sacrifice as enough and his worthiness now becomes ours. So I believe in him. I believe that he is your son. I believe that he really died and bled for me. I believe that he rose again as alive. And because of that, I'm gonna live my life for him. He's the only one that ever did that. I believe him in Jesus' name. I'm no longer headed towards a devil's hell, but now I'm headed towards a heaven made for me. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for the Bridge Goldsboro Online. We hope that something in this sermon resonated with you and your family. If you haven't already, take some time to fill out the Connect card in the chat box below, or you can go to bridgechurch.cc. We'd love to know how we can come alongside of you and your family in the next steps. Thank you for joining us this Sunday. We can't wait to see you next week.